Sounds good, Chris. Thanks. All right. Good morning, everybody. We're going to give it just a minute or two uh, to, to um, allow a few more folks to hop on. Um, and just as a heads up, I am going to go through the um, the roster of um, different agencies and just ask for folks to um, to announce themselves um, if they are the representative. I recognize that in a couple of places um, there are more than one um, representative from your uh, from your agency. But if uh, if one person could just sort of uh, announce themselves as the um, as the attendee or the surrogate for today, that would be really helpful so that I kind of know who's who. And then I always like to do um, a question to kick us off uh, as we go around. Um, and my question today, and I would encourage honesty in answering this question. My question today is, when you were a kid, did you look forward more to the first day of school or to the last day of school? And uh, I, I road tested that question in my household this morning. And unfortunately, I was called a nerd. Um, and so you'll all know which way I go on that one. Um, but that's the, the heads up. So we're going to go around in just a second. Um, uh, we'll see who, um, who is here on behalf of our agencies. And um, we will find out just how many folks are like me, um, folks who could not sleep. Um, the night before the first day of school because all their pencils were organized in their little pencil holder and I was ready to go with all my notebooks and I had my new backpack and I was just, um, I was ready to go. I couldn't wait to meet my new teacher and become her new best friend, um, which was what I did every year. So, um, so that was me for sure. No shame in my game. Um, but I know I'm among friends at the Leadership Council on early years. So I think we're getting close um, here. So I think we'll, um, we'll go ahead and, um, and find out um, who is with us this morning. Um, I think, hold on, I have to, I get so excited about this that I, um, <laughs> that I forget to follow my, my, my notes on what I'm actually supposed to be doing. Um, okay, so I, I guess, I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Thank you all for making the time uh, to join us and thank you for, um, for representing your agency. If you're here, if you're here for the first time, we certainly welcome you. Uh, we meet about four times a year and uh, really excited about some of the, the, the ways we've been able to share information, connect dots, highlight opportunities to work um, deeper and closer together. Uh, before we go around, um, we did share the draft meeting minutes from the January 27th Leadership Council on Early Years meeting, which we do need to approve. I'm wondering if somebody would move to approve those minutes. I saw Peter Barker raise his hand. Yep, so I'll move. All right, great. And Rebecca, I see you um, second that motion. Um, if I could just have everybody say aye or, or raise their hand, we'll approve those minutes. Excellent, thank you very much. Any opposed? All right, great. So we got that piece of business out of the way. Thank you. So I'd like to do again, that quick round of introductions. I'm just gonna go agency by agency. And if you are the representative, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself, say who, uh, what you do in the agency, what your, what your role is. And, um, and then my little icebreaker question of the day is, when you were a kid, did you look more forward to the first day of school or the last day of school? And I would encourage you to be honest. Um, so I think I would love to start, of course, uh, with the governor and the first lady, uh, please. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Governor Evers, and I have to acknowledge my nerdiness. First day of school, without a doubt. First Lady Kathy Evers and Emily, I know we have a lot in common, and that's one of our first day of school. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, great. Thank you both for being here today. We'll go to uh, DWD. Do we have a rep from DWD? Good morning, Emily and all. Um, I'm Jennifer Cole. I'm the legislative liaison. I'm sitting in for Danielle Williams this morning. Um, 
and I, yes, absolutely the first day of school, but because this group cares about bullying and such, I would say I stopped being the first day of school person when bullying started in middle school. So yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of people shaking their heads like, yep, that tracks. All right. Thanks, Jen. Uh, welcome. CHS. I see Curtis there. Hi, I'm uh, Curtis Cunningham. I'm the assistant administrator for benefits and service delivery within the Medicaid program. So oversee coverage policy and then how we put those uh, various services together for specialized populations. Um, I don't know, this might be breaking the rules, but I often uh, really wanted to get to school on the first day, but also really wanted to get out of school on the last day. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mixed on that one. So. That's that's okay. Um, my colleague, Erin Arango Escalante, uh, loves a both and, and a both and <laughs> is a worthy answer. Um, okay, do we have a representative from uh, WEDC? All right. How about DOT today? DOT is here. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Thanks. And who, I'm sorry, who um, who is on for DOT? Is that Kathy? Yep. Okay, great. And Kathy, you don't get out of answering my question. Oh, I just logged in. I just hopped in from another meeting. Oh, <laughs> Where uh, our icebreaker is, were you more of a first day of school person or a last day of school person when you were a kid? I was more of a last day of school. All right, that's fair. <laughs> okay, moving along. I see Mary there from DVA. I'm with Curtis, and uh, I think this time of year just highlights it that I want to get outside. So um, that last day, get outside. Absolutely. Love it. Um, okay, I see Stephen Little on from DNR. Welcome. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Stephen Little. I'm the uh, Assistant Deputy Secretary for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And um, I would say when I was a kid, I was definitely a last day of school uh, kind of person. My mom was a uh, school teacher, so I kind of felt like I was always in school, uh, but the last day of school for me meant that I got to go to this really cool park that was uh, um, not too far away from uh, my uh, grammar school, so that was definitely a highlight. Love it. All right, thanks and welcome. Um, okay, I see Secretary Barka over from DOR. Terrific to be with you, and uh, I was definitely more of a last day. I'm not as big of a baseball fan as the governors, but I love to play. And that meant when I got to play like four days a week. So I love the last day of school, except in fifth grades, I was in love with Janice Wells and I didn't get to see her over the summer. So that was my first day of year. Ah, uh, that first heartbreak. <laughs> uh, I love it. Okay, over to DOA, I see Olivia. Hi, I'm and Olivia Huang, Assistant Deputy Secretary at DOA. I'm sitting in for uh, Secretary Blumenfeld today. And I actually, I loved being in school, but I really didn't like the first day or the last day because as a Marine Corps brat, it was always a new school and being anxious at being around new kids. And then at the end of the year, being really sad because we were moving and leaving another group of kids. So um, not, not, really, uh, not really answering the, the, or picking the, between the two options, but the truthful answer, so. All right, thanks, Olivia. How about Melissa from DOC? Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Secretary. I am sitting in for Secretary Carr, who is taking some more than well-deserved days off at the end of this week. So um, I might have to raise the bar on the nerdiness because it's definitely first day of school for me, but I also used to make my older sisters play school with me before school started once we had our school supplies purchased. So. Wonderful. I love it. Um, I was that way too. Actually, small story, there was a teacher supply store down the road from my house and I begged to go there and get the, the grading books and all of that. So I used to say my stuffed animals were very well taught. Um, all right, next we have um, somebody I'm really excited to introduce. Um, Elmer Moore, are you on with us today? Um, our new representative and our new um, exec director from WIDA. 
or Jessica, are you representing today? Uh, he, Elmer is not able to make it today, um, or he might be able to join a little bit later, but he's still training. And so he sends his regrets. He's personally very interested in this topic, uh, but he's um, still um, managing all the internal meetings and getting getting onboarded. So he says, um, he sends his regrets. Um, uh, but for me, I'll be sitting in today. I'm Jessica Bowling, I'm Assistant Deputy Director at WIDA. Great. And how about you, Jessica? First day, last day? Um, I was definitely a last day. Uh, I was never, I've never been a morning person. So even as a kid, I didn't really like it. So this makes me, it's, it convinced me it's a genetic thing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And welcome to you too, uh, as you both start your new roles at WIDA. We're very excited to have you on board. Thank you. Um, yep. How about over to um, financial institutions, DFI? Kathy, you are on mute. So let's see if we can get Sorry about there. That. You go. Um, yep. I don't know why I was having problems with that. Um, I'm Catherine Hoverland. I'm the assistant deputy secretary here, um, filling in for secretary designee Olson Collins. And I have to say, you know, just like Curtis and Mary, they were probably equal, but um, fortunately you limited it to our childhood because as a parent, it was always the last day of school. I loved having my kids around for the summer. I love it. Thank you so much. And um, I'm not sure if we have anybody on from DPI today. Anybody hiding in there? All right. And how about Rebecca from uh, um, Canopy? Sure. Uh, good morning, Secretary. Rebecca Murray from the Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Board. Um, I'm the Executive Director. Um, I was a first day um, person. Um, both my parents were public educators, um, but also loved the last day because I'm a, I'm a Gen X, so the summer meant there was no rules and you just stayed outside all day too. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for being here. And um, over to the Office of Children's Mental Health, Linda. Hi, good morning, everyone. Linda Hall, the director of the Office of Children's Mental Health. I was definitely a first day um, of school person, except that all this conversation this morning is reminding me of the last day of second grade, where this was a year when um, our class was in the gym and I think our teacher felt bad about it. And she it was a hard year. And so on the last day of school, she gave out kisses on the cheek to anybody who wanted one. And I went and got in line because I liked her a lot. Oh, wow. She was a good teacher under those hard circumstances. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. And I'm not sure that we have anybody on from DAT CAP today, but I'll give a second here. Okay, and did I miss anybody inadvertently um, or miss an agency? Okay, great. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I always love to um, build a little bit of community around our um, our zero to five population and and um, and kids, and I love learning a little bit about you um, in the process. So thanks for uh, being game and playing along with me there. Um, really excited about today's meeting. Um, you'll remember we did some brainstorming, I believe at our last meeting, and um, we're really starting to push into agendas that are, um, that are really co-built by this council and ordered up um, you know, by this council in terms of what do you guys wanna talk about? Um, how do you wanna connect the dots? And um, so very excited to, um, to be able to tap into some of my colleagues' knowledge and experiences and expertise this morning. Um, really looking today at um, what, where are the innovations and the promising practices in uh, reducing poverty and enhancing economic mobility uh, through supporting families. And so um, I know last week you would have received uh, an email with some background on today's topics, um, talking specifically about recommendations to policymakers uh, to cut child poverty and uh, some emerging research on the impacts of financial support on child well being, and as well as some other innovations to reduce um, child poverty and increase economic opportunity for families. Um, I've had the pleasure of hear, hearing uh, from all of the folks that, that we'll be hearing from today, and, um, and I know that they are going to make a strong case for why investments in, in quality, 
early childhood programming and supports are critical for our economy, for the long-term health and wellness of our state, um, and, and what we can do about it. Um, so really excited to hear today um, more specifically, more bro broadly about why those investments are so important. Um, also information about the 2021 tax credits, child tax credits and other tax benefits, including the fact that the child tax credit lifted more than 28,000 Wisconsin families out of poverty. We're going to be hearing some groundbreaking research on the impacts of poverty on children, including babies' first years, and other research and policy innovation uh, present, presented to us by uh, our own Institute um, for Research on Poverty, and Hilary Schrager joins us there. Um, so very, very glad to be able to kind of build on this discussion that we've been having to um, ensure that all kids in Wisconsin have access to high quality early learning and supports. Um, we talk a lot about um, some of the tools that we at DCF have to support that uh, by using our preschool development grant funding and other critical federal relief funding. Um, at one of our meetings last fall, Rebecca Marie shared information about resources uh, through our family resource agencies and efforts to make sure um, to, to make sure that we truly support um, our community resources there. Um, and we're um, personally, um, from a DCF perspective, um, excited to build on some of the work that we shared last time around our reform in our child welfare system so that more kids have um, access to healthy social and emotional experiences, less trauma, um, and we know that that makes a big difference in, in the lives of families. Um, as we continue to promote economic recovery through COVID-19 through COVID-19 funding, um, that is uh, just a key piece of, uh, again, the tools in our toolbox for helping to make sure that Wisconsin uh, truly supports families. So um, we've got a number of presentations. We think they'll fit together really nicely. We've got a little bit of time for discussion on the back end to help to kind of connect to these presentations together. Um, and of course, uh, we have some exciting updates just, just in the, um, in, before we get into our presentations that we'd like to share and continue to keep you really updated and connected to the work that's going on in, in kind of our braided uh, birth to five delivery system. So I would like to invite my, um, my colleague, Erin uh, Arango Escalante to spend a little bit of time giving you that update. Erin. All right, good morning, everybody. We have the PowerPoint fired up and we are ready to go. So I'm gonna start with, with the next slide here. I just wanna ground us in our, in our thinking on how we are moving the needle in early care and education. And as a reminder, we are focused on ensuring that all Wisconsin families have access to high quality and affordable early care and education opportunities that meet the unique needs of our families. And we are doing that by really moving the dial on access affordability, quality in workforce to advance and promote equity and inclusion in our state. And we do it at, very, at many levels. We focus on the family, on our early care and education providers, and on our communities. And so what I wanna share with you next is just a, a little snippet of our federal relief dollars and how some of the, the programs that, that Emily talked about are being represented here. So you can see right now, and this is, this is I think newer since the last time we talked, is our American Rescue Plan Act dollars. A couple of things I just wanna share with you. We have had um, a significant amount of money going to child, going to child care providers through our Child Care Counts program. These are monthly payments that go out to all regulated child care providers. But look at this amount, we have 27 months of ongoing payments to support high quality care and to support workforce recruitment and retention. We've talked about family resource centers. We have money that has been earmarked for family resource centers in the past. Um, we've also talked a lot about um, uh, our, our workforce and employer sponsored programs. We are braiding funding, which is so exciting. If you, if you just click, you'll see here the, the 
the two, the, there's actually three funding source, sources. We're using our Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, 10 million from there, our American Rescue Plan Act, another 10 million, and then 1 million from our preschool development grant. This is an idea that was really born in this group. So I just wanna take a little bit of a deeper dive into really thinking about project growth. On the next slide, we, we did some research first and we had about a hundred, um, excuse me, a thousand in employees and employers respond to a survey. And I think this information is just really helpful. We talked about childcare in this survey. And what are the reasons um, that we need to, that employers need to explore child and family benefits? And um, you can see here some of the, you know, some of the data, we know that it is less disruptive to companies that for in place to have childcare. It's a great way for rec to, to recruit and retain high qualified staff. And this is employers across the sectors, those that, those industries that each and every one of you support. And the next slide, you'll see some more information um, right here where we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has really put a, put a damper on access to high quality care for employees. Um, and in fact, employers have seen, um, employees have a reduction in hours. They've seen it very difficult to, to really hire high qualified employees. We see all of these um, these outcomes and impacts of the pandemic. And again, we've talked a lot about this in this space, about the need to recruit and retain and really get back to work, make sure that, that we are doing this across all of the sectors that, that you all represent. And so in the next slide, you will see too, that both employees and employers have found it important to support childcare. Um, these are strategies that, that we need to put in place. I'm sure each and every one of you have heard it. We have heard it. And so we've been able to make some significant gains in this space. On the next slide. I wanna talk about project growth. And again, um, some really exciting work in this project growth space. Just so folks are aware, um, this we, we had our letters, um, letters of intent to award have, have actually gone out for project growth. I wanna give you just a really brief snapshot of, of, what, of what it is. Under project growth, we have two grant opportunities. The first is Dream Up. And that is where communities have applied to really focus on their strategic plan, to get dollars to then implement their strategic plan and to begin work. So we had a number of communities apply across the state, 29 communities, excuse me, 39 communities. We were able to award um, many, many uh, uh, communities, gosh, like close to, you know, two thirds of those communities are receiving funding to do this. We'll be giving a lot more information about this, but it has been exciting. We are across the state. We are in all, all regions, many different types, rural, urban, um, tribal, you name it. And it is, it is amazing to see that. So there'll be more information that will be shared about that. It's pretty hot off the press. In addition, we had tremendous interest in our partner up work. And if you remember that are, that really is about those businesses that are purchasing childcare slots for their employees. We had over 660 employers apply for this program. We have uh, $21 million earmarked for this program. A lot of excitement that is happening. We are going to, um, you know, right now we're about 40% of those who applied. So be able to be able to receive these dollars to make sure that they can purchase childcare slots for their employees. That number is going to go up. We know that this is of interest. We know that there's a lot of excitement about this um, and we are able to support this knowing that for sustainability efforts, you're going to see a little bit of a change. Right now, we are, we are paying up to about 75% of the true cost of care. Um, employees are, are 
are um, are providing about 25% of that true cost of care. Over time, you're gonna see that shift. Employers are going to see the benefit, the return on this investment for their employees. And there's just a lot of excitement. So I just wanna share that update. Again, This is these are ideas that have really come from this group. In our, in our employees, you are going, excuse me, in the employers that are represented here, you are going to see all of your organizations that you all represent in this list. I can tell you everything from health and long-term care to, um, to child care to, um, there's even a, a group of, of, of funeral homes, of farmers, of, I mean, you name it, it's across the state. Every region is represented. People were very interested because they know really the impact of being able to provide and pay for high quality care for their employees. That return on that investment is critical. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody here for communicating with, with your, your people, that your stakeholders. There was a lot of interest. On the next slide, I wanna take just a moment um, to talk a little bit more about the, the family and, and go a little bit deeper in equity and inclusion. One of the things that we have heard and on the next slide is that we really needed to focus on our, our lived experience and our family voice and making sure that families are part of the conversation, particularly their needs as we're developing policy and programs. And so we, based on a conversation that we have had here previously, we have been able to identify communities where we need to really strengthen those conversations. And looking at our data, we have selected Beloit, Adams County, and Le Couture. And we have an urban, a rural, and a tribal community. We have pulled together parents that really represent our our cross-sector birth through five system um, that have experience in many of the programs such as early intervention and birth to three, early childhood special education, child care, Head Start, um, foster care, you name it. A lot of the programs that touch all of the work that we do. So we formed this group and on the next slide, the purpose of this particular group is to really connect connect and hear that lived experience, um, to be able to listen to what their needs are, to, to offer, to allow them to have opportunities for feedback sessions in their communities and have them come back and inform the work that we do from the beginning and throughout the, the time frame of each policy and programmatic decision. And we are going to act, we are going to hear that lived experience, really be thoughtful and intentional about how we include it throughout our, the, our development and implementation process. So on April 9th, we had our first Parent and Caregiver Equity Advisory Cabinet meeting. I have to tell you, it was, I've never been so nervous for a meeting than this meeting that we had on April 9th. I, I, I couldn't even sleep the night before. So talk about being ready for the first day of school. Oh boy, I was, um, I was so nervous. Uh, it was one of the most powerful meetings I had. And in fact, our, our first lady um, did a welcome video. Uh, Secretary Amundsen was there and every single parent showed. They showed at 10 a.m. on a Saturday. And the feedback, that relationship that we started to build um, was incredible. And the feedback that we received about the importance of hearing their voice, their experience, and how we plan to incorporate their feedback within these communities into our everyday work was, was so, it was just so touching and moving. We will be having um, quarterly cabinet meetings with these parents. They are infested. They are, I, I just can't get over how meaningful this work is. So I wanted to make sure you all know this and we will make sure to share information from this group back with you as well. So those are our, our really big updates. Um, there's a lot happening, a lot of excitement. And I, I just wanna thank you for your continued support in early care and education. It is, it is amazing and just tremendously, tremendously helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. And um, just to echo um, two quick things that Erin said. N number one, we were just bowled over to get over 660 applications for, for our Partner Up grant program. Um, it's the first time DCF has really 
actively reached out to you know, private sector business community, we could not have done it without your help. Uh, you all were so helpful in helping to connect us to the right folks uh, to really get the word out. And so just want to double down on Aaron's thank you there. And then, um, and then this piece around, um, around sort of incorporating lived experience into the policymaking process. I know this is something that a lot of, um, of us as agency leaders are looking at. Um, there are a number of, um, of leaders within this group that are, um, are very, very skilled at doing that. And we wanna thank um, you for, for um, teaching us um, how to be successful, at least um, with this first meeting. And again, this, um, this concept was really born out of the conversation that this group had with, uh, with Dr. K Sherry Killen-Stewart uh, about a year ago, uh, where she challenged this group to really think about um, folks that were most impacted um, and, and potentially least heard in our decision-making process. So I'm really excited to be able to deliver this um, as another uh, as another great uh, win for Wisconsin, but also uh, an impact um, piece for this group. So uh, thanks, Erin. I think we'll keep rolling here. And um, now I'm really excited uh, to introduce Dennis Winters, uh, who serves as the chief economist over at the Department of Workforce Development. Um, I know many of us have had the pleasure of listening to one of Dennis's talks in some form or fashion. Um, and once you do, you just see the you see the data differently and you see um, the state differently. And we feel so lucky uh, to, to have a chief economist um, who thinks about workforce the way that Dennis does. And uh, he has always been seen as a leader in, um, in the early childhood space. And it's, it's no secret that this is a particular interest of his. Um, he has published a number of really important reports that help to really like make the economic case for investments in early childhood, uh, that help to show the economic impact of things like 4K in Wisconsin, and has really grown up as a, a national voice in that conversation. So really um, happy to have you here, Dennis, and thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. And Dennis, you're still on mute. All right, there we go. There well, you go. All right. yep. well, good morning. Thank you, um, Secretary, Governor, uh, the rest. Uh, thanks for having me in. I'll, I'll kind of scoot through my PowerPoint presentation here. Somebody was going to help um, there if we start with the basic premise. One thing I wanted to add before we go here is that, you know, the uh, BLS had a pulse survey out and uh, for Wisconsin, there were about 100, because of COVID at one point, uh, when they did the survey, there was about 120,000 kids that were out of daycare because of COVID influences. So if you just look at that and say you have, you know, two kids per parent uh, or household, say you have, um, you know, that's 60,000 workers uh, that were not in the workforce because of COVID. And, and we know what the situation is around the workforce these days. So uh, this kind of thing is critical. So yeah, the premise I want to start out with, it just, you know, must be absolutely understood, right? That knowledge and skills are elements of Wisconsin's economic competitiveness in, and success in the global economy. I mean, this is just the way it is, um, and it will continue to be so, and has been for some time. Uh, and for me, it was falling off a log just from going from our, our workforce situation to early childhood development uh, when I got in here. So um, that's the premise we have to start with. Uh, and, and I think it's more and more clear to everybody as we go forward. I'll scoot through a lot of these slides. If I can go to the next one, um, this is an uh, interpretation I've gotten out of um, James, some of James Heckman's work down uh, University of Chicago, um, that we got to use the right policies. I mean, for a long time, we've been trying to um, solve uh, education through poverty. And I, and I think it's the other way around that if you can solve education, uh, especially early uh, education and development, uh, and what it leads to then, uh, you're, you're gonna do a, a lot to get out of poverty for uh, those, those people. Uh, next slide, this is just kind of a condensation of the number of studies that have been out there showing the cost benefits and the, uh, the cost ratios. Um, and these are a whole series. The granddaddy of them all is kind of the Perry Preschool, uh, one at the top. And these are just a series of essentially controlled experiments uh, that are looking at uh, early childhood development returns and uh, in net present value. So it's been demonstrated uh, that these programs are effective. Uh, and, and the next slide, please. And this is how this again, this is from Perry Preschool, um, but you can see where the, where the returns uh, on investment 
go, uh, 20% to the individual, 80% uh, to society. So it's a, it's a public good um, if we make these investments um, and the sheds that uh, they go from one to the other. Next slide, please. You can see uh, some work by Robert Lynch that showed what the, what the, where we get positive on the returns essentially. It's eight, seven, eight years out uh, that we start turning positive numbers, uh, started getting positive cash flow. Uh, and it's interesting if you, and this is some historical data, right? But if you look at that little bump in the, what would be the years in this study at about 2019, uh, 18, that bump is due to the increase in state costs for supporting more kids going to college. Uh, so kind of an interesting uh, ramification of that. And then the next slide, please, the, the returns, everybody talks about, oh, this is a 20 year program. Well, no, it's not. I mean, it's immediate. And, we, and, and we've already talked about a little bit about that, how productivity in the workforce. Um, if you know your kid is being cared for in a quality um, service, then you're gonna be able to pay more attention to your job and be more productive. And you can see the breakdown here between the intermediate or the immediate short-term, medium-term and long-term. Um, uh, of what this happens. Um, and this is one of those things, you know, I, I go back to the old forester, you know, when's the best plant, but when's the best time to plant a tree? Uh, 20 years ago, right? Well, the second best time is now. So we knew about this for quite some time. Had we, had we put that, uh, that root ball in the ground some time ago, we'd, we'd, we'd be much better off uh, at this point in time. And so that's been a little bit frustrating for me uh, to, get, to get some of this done and, and in place. Next, please. Uh, this is where the returns go. Um, you know, 20% of the returns, oh, next slide, if you could, yep. 20% uh, of the returns go to the individual, better employment opportunities, here's the list. 80% of it goes to the public. Um, and, that, and that means, you know, uh, more return on your tax buck, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and in business, you know, you run in what's the biggest problem they have right now, it's workforce, right? It used to be workforce taxes and, and regulation. Uh, now it's workforce um, and then taxes and regulation. So it's, um, they know what they're feeling it. And that's why a lot of this has risen again to the, to the forefront is that it is directly now impacting uh, their business and their top lines um, because, of the, because of the combination of um, the uh, changing the, the slow growing workforce uh, and the talent and, and, and everything they need um, on the production side of things. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a little more just iteration, you know, of it. Um, you know, traditionally, cannot, this is out of, you know, uh, Art Rolnick at the Minneapolis Fed um, back in traditional economic development tools produce zero public return or worse. And in this particular, and, and I've done work in the past, uh, in this particular case, we're talking about um, stadiums uh, and, and the billion dollars or billion five that was going into stadiums um, at the time. And, and, uh, and we know the net present or the, the economic return on that is, is zero at best. So, and then whether the alternative will the returns to high quality education, right? Have been, they produce large, low risk, long lived returns. So who doesn't want that, right? I mean, it's, that's the way to go and it's gonna do uh, something for everybody um, going across. Next slide then is, um, you know, so I, I say the questions have been answered, right? What's the, what's the greatest economic development need? Well, it's a skilled, creative, interactive workforce. Uh, that's just, that's been true for a while and now it's critical um, as, as we're seeing day to day uh, and, and, and will continue to be so. And so what are the returns? 17 to one. 80% of it goes to the public. Uh, and, and Minneapolis Fed had, you know, 16% um, per year. Uh, rate of return. If you can duplicate that on a regular basis, um, I, I would like to talk to you uh, in some other way. So is it fiscally prudent? Uh, the, the, the scenarios we went through, the cost of it, you know, it's a tiny fraction of the total amount of money we spend on public uh, K through 12 school funding. So, and what's your alternative? Well, it's, it's, it's not a new entertainment development, right? Um, the returns on investment are, are, it's just the way to go. Um, and, and we've demonstrated that and illustrated that again and again. So it's all cost effective, it's, it's relevant. Um, next slide. Uh, and it's critical for um, Wisconsin's workforce in particular, as some of you may have seen my blue line, yellow line graph here. Uh, the, the focus on the blue line is that Wisconsin's workforce is topping out, may even go negative by 2035. The critical piece about this is we don't raise productivity of that workforce. You know, we're looking at possible economic stagnation. One of the ways we, we raise productivity is we match talent with technology. Uh, and so therefore it's critical that we have the workforce with the talent to match the technology uh, that's gonna take us forward and, and let us grow uh, our economy and, and the uh, standard of living for everybody. So then summing up uh, in the next slide, 
you know, and this is, again, this one's kind of for me, you know, the best and most effective way uh, to increase the quality of our workforce and lessen the tax burden is to invest in quality early childhood development. And I state the sooner and earlier, the better. I'm, a, I'm actually a prenatal to age eight uh, camp um, as, a, as, as far as it goes to uh, helping early childhood development, both physically, physiologically, emotionally, socially, and economically. So um, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dennis. And um, I want to um, maybe save any uh, more ponderous questions until the end of all of our uh, mini presentations this morning. But does anybody have any clarifying questions for Dennis? Uh, anything that was was just unclear or or um, or just a clarifier? Okay, I did, I did better oh, than yeah. I thought. Yeah, well, and you, you made us up some minutes too, Dennis, so um, many thanks to you on that. All right, great. Um, thank you so much. Now, um, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Secretary Peter Barca, who serves admirably over at the Department of Revenue. And um, today, he's going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the role that tax credits play in uh, in lifting families out of poverty. And in particular, we already talked a little bit about the child tax credit, but the impacts um, that those programs have in keeping a family stable um, to, to, to be able to access the kinds of supports that, that Dennis just highlighted in his presentation. So um, Peter, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Emily. Uh, what a delight to be with you all. And Dennis, terrific job. I know Dennis works very closely with uh, many of our economists. Uh, and together we have really, I think, just terrific data. And I loved your conclusion, Dennis, about investing in child care. And as Dennis also said, I want to you know, maybe underscore his point that workforce is the biggest issue. You know, we go all around the state. And we put on what we call web roundtables with business leaders and economic development professionals in chambers. And we were in Platteville actually with city council and the chamber just this week. And they, they underscored that. You'll be happy to know Secretary Amundsen, uh, you know, they really took a particular interest in childcare when we presented a couple slides that you've given to us. So uh, we appreciate that very much. The interest is definitely growing as the concerns about, you know, a workforce um, mount up uh, as we move forward and the economy is revved up and doing well under Governor Inger's leadership. So next slide, um, I want to start with the earned income tax credit. So this is one of the more, well, this is just our mission vision value. So you can move on from there. Although I do want to also punctuate what Secretary Amundsen said at the onset. And, um, you know, her point could not be more important that the federal credit, you know, that came on child care, lifting 28,000 families out of poverty. I, I have the good fortune of serving on the IRS advisory committee. And we talk about all that, all that all the time and, and sort of the challenges that they face, like we faced administering grant programs where they were sending out money, you know, proactively. And what an incredible difference that made along with uh, Wisconsin was number one in the country in terms of sharing our funds to uh, help lift people out of poverty, to help businesses get on the other side of the pandemic and rental assistance and all of those things that are, are so important. And Linda, thank you for the point that you just uh, listed that the CDC says the EITC reduces behavioral issues for kids. That I did not know, but I know it's one of the best anti-poverty measures. And one of the things that we've done um, under the EITC is, is we've challenged our um, tax operations crew to look and find out what people in Wisconsin are not claiming the ITC that perhaps should. And so every year we've been sending out letters proactively to people that look like they qualify but didn't. And the good news is fewer we have to send out fewer letters because more people are taking advantage of it. We started this back in 2020. We sent out almost 15,000 letters and then the next year almost a thousand more people took advantage of it. So we had sent out like 14,000 letters. And, this year, down to 11,900 letters, but it works because many people just, you know, are not that familiar with the tax code and, you know, people that are in sort of the lower and lower middle income categories can't afford accountants to 
kind of guide them. So that's something that, you know, the governor encouraged us to do. I think it really has made a difference. We're very proud of uh, our efforts to be proactive because we, we want every Wisconsinite to take advantage of whatever credits exist, but we're particularly proactive when it comes to people that are sort of at the lower end of the economic scale, knowing what a positive difference uh, that makes for them in their lives. Um, the next slide, um, the child care credit, one of the successes of the budget is the governor had increased uh, in his budget, the child care credit, and we're now at 50% of the federal credit which is very, very important. It's a big step forward. And I'll show later in my presentation, the governor's call for a special session to raise that to 100%. And um, you know, to underscore some of the points that, that Dennis made, that truly makes a difference. And I'll show you some slides coming up here to show that that changes the equation. What our economists tell us is that if people have more funds to afford childcare, that helps more people to go into the workforce. So it's very important to do this both as an anti-poverty measure. It's also important from a workforce standpoint. And it's one of the more important things that we can do. And, you know, you qualify if uh, uh, your annual income is not more than $150,000 uh, um, being married or $112,000 if you're ahead of a household or $75,000 if you're a single file. Um, so it covers, you know, you know, even up to the almost the... Uh, uh, the upper ends of the middle class. So it's a very broad credit. It's very important. And uh, we know it works is some of the evidence that you saw from uh, Dennis. Um, next slide. Um, the child independent care credit. Um, this is the one where uh, is part of the uh, surplus plan that the governor's suggesting grow to 100%. And uh, we know that would make such a difference in the lives of people. Um, next, next slide. Next slide, um, you're gonna see that the labor force and Dennis alluded to this as well. Here's a couple other slides to illustrate the point. And one thing that one of the myths that exists out there that our economists will tell you is labor force participation in Wisconsin is outstanding. We're one of the top 10 in the nation. People in Wisconsin believe in hard work, they wanna work. And if we help facilitate that, we know that they in fact will join the labor force. Um, you can see that in those two slides, you know, of course, during the pandemic when, you know, because of the public health emergency, many people could not work. And that's where the stimulus dollars had a very positive effect, both the federal dollars and also the dollars that, um, you know, uh, were deployed from Wisconsin. And, but it is somewhat leveling off, as you can see in the second slide, as Dennis indicated. And, um, and that's where in the next slide, you're going to see that helping people to go back to work can make such a difference. Because when you look at disaggregate data that our economists put together, you can see where you have a little lower workforce petition rate, uh, participation rate is for people who are married and people with kids. And oftentimes it falls more disproportionately on women than it does on men, but, but really for any parents, it's a factor. And that's why you know, strategies like the earned income tax credit child dependent care credit makes such an incredible difference. Um, next slide. Um, you know, here's, you can, you can see with labor force participation um, compared to pre-pandemic levels, it was, it's down for women, but up for men. And again, that's where childcare is just so incredibly important. Next slide. The positive news for us in Wisconsin, and I was with John Koskin and who's our senior economist and you know, I, I, uh, he and I present very well together because uh, we've known each other for so long. And, and I, I like to say, you know, how do I know that Wisconsin's fiscal health is the strongest in a half century? Because John Koskinen has been around a half century and he told us that's the case. But academic data does prove that out. And uh, it's something that we all in Wisconsin can be proud of. Uh, you know, it's something that, you know, we've worked extremely hard as an administration on. You know, the governor, uh, I was very proud to be part of his presentation on the bond rating to the bond rating agencies. And they were very favorably impressed with the steps that we've taken as a state to put us in a strong fiscal position. I came back to the legislature in 2008. When I came back, um, we had a, a fiscal situation that we had structural deficits as far as the eye can see. It was so bad that even legislators, you know, took uh, uh, days off in order to uh, help balance the budget to try and set an example. And um, 
Now we have structural surpluses as far as the eye can see, which is such a terrific place to be in because then we can do the things as Dennis indicated, uh, which is invest in early childhood education, invest in daycare. And, and as he indicated, and I've had the good fortune of serving on WDC's board since uh, really its inception. And this is clearly a strategy that we've talked about. I know uh, Secretary Missy Kincaid embraces this and it's something we're working together to try and have more investments because workforce is the name of the game and, and child care is a big part of it, but also even just for child care outcomes. Uh, you know, we're a stronger state as our children are successful and doing well. And so we will end this uh, this uh, fiscal year with a $3.8 billion surplus, if you can imagine. Um, that's the largest in history. Never in my wildest dreams, uh, you know, from when I first served in the legislature, uh, you know, up through with the time that I joined the cabinet, could I ever imagine we'd be in that strong of a fiscal position. And in fact, our rainy day fund is the strongest it's ever been. In addition to the $3.8 billion surplus, we have $1.7 billion sitting in our rainy day fund. And on the next slide, you can see that's why the governor produced a, a plan um, which may, would make such a positive difference in terms of poverty. One would be to give a, a you know, sort of a surplus refund of $150 to each person, uh, be $600 for a family of four. And with inflation being a major issue that we cannot control as a state, in fact, even as a nation, it's hard because it's a worldwide you know, problem right now. And as a consequence, this would really be a plus for people in those uh, lower to middle income categories. But equally important, what the governor's plan would do is to produce a, a permanent tax break to increase the child and caregiver credit to 100%. And the research is so strong, what a positive differential that would make. And of course, the governor being a former superintendent of schools, obviously wants to invest and support our schools more. So. Anyway, uh, Emily, thank you so much. That's my uh, presentation. And uh, you know, I applaud uh, your agency and all you've done. One of the things I always say with great pride when I'm presenting around the state is that we have more childcare uh, slots open for people post-pandemic than we had pre-pandemic, which is just such a credit to you and uh, your team and the leadership that you've uh, put forward and also the investments that we've made. So uh, I, I'm so pleased to be a part of this. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you so much, Secretary Barca. Um, really appreciate your continued uh, commitment to this group and also to, um, to, to really finding the ways that help to, to stabilize families and lift families up. Um, very, very great presentation. Um, and again, I just wanna ask for any, um, are there any quick questions or any quick clarifying questions for Secretary Barca? Um, knowing that we'll get a little bit of time on the back end for discussion. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do, I think Hillary is, um, I think we'll just take a five minute break, um, just a comfort break. I've got 1022 and then we'll go ahead and, um, and uh, finish our mini presentations with um, some really great, exciting, promising practice um, looks from Hillary Schrager from um, IRP. And um, and so I've got, let's see, 1022. So let's come back around 1027. And um, Hillary, you can take it away from there. Thanks, everybody.
All right, folks, as we welcome folks back um, into the room, I um, would love to uh, formally introduce uh, Dr. Hillary Shager, um, who is the Associate Director at University of Wisconsin's Institute for Research on Poverty. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't also say DCF alum. Um, so always, uh, always a pleasure to be able to invite um, Hillary uh, back into the fold and also to highlight just like what an amazing and excellent um, resource and gem the Institute for Research on Poverty is uh, right here in our own backyard at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So always grateful for um, the work that that you do, uh, that the institute does, and uh, and in the partnerships that I think that many of any many of us uh, enjoy with uh, IRP. So with that, um, very excited to hear from Hillary on some of the um, the promising practices that are emerging in this field. There's a lot of activity and a lot of really interesting research happening around um, child poverty right now. Thanks, Hillary. Thank you so much, Secretary Amundsen, and I just uh, want to second the, the love uh, <laughs> for being back with DCF and, and appreciate this great opportunity. And um, for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar, um, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen here. Um, yep, yeah. um, great. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with the Institute for Research on Poverty, we are the only federally funded uh, national research center on poverty and economic mobility in the country. Um, we've been around for a long time since the war on poverty and um, really enjoy um, and uh, benefit and are grateful for our partnership with the Department of Children and Families and many of the other agencies um, that are represented here today. Um, so without further ado, I'll kind of jump in. Um, I often uh, uh, have the opportunity to do work and talk about early childhood education research. And today I'm going to swim a little bit upstream um, and talk about uh, some other new programs and promising policies that, like uh, um, Secretary Barca talked about, allow access to some of these early childhood opportunities and why it's important for us to think about child poverty, um, the causes and consequences of it. Some work that was done pre-COVID about thinking about ways to cut child poverty in half using existing programs and policies. Some lessons we learned from COVID with the expanded child tax credit, and then some uh, really innovative programs that we're currently doing some research around, including guaranteed income programs, something called Baby's First Years, which the Secretary mentioned, uh, baby bonds, and then we'll talk about policy implications. So just really briefly talking about child poverty in Wisconsin, these are pre-COVID numbers. Um, we are, the data uh, sort of during COVID is still pretty messy and we're still sort of trying to understand that. So I just wanted to start with a picture, but this is child poverty in Wisconsin measured three different ways. Um, the top line is just um, market income poverty. So that's literally just measuring families income. So that's why it's the highest. Um, the middle is the official poverty measure, the federal poverty measure. And then um, the bottom is um, the Wisconsin poverty measure, which was developed at the Institute for Research on Poverty. And that takes into account not only the cash benefits that are taken into account um, with the federal poverty measure, but um, it also accounts for non-cash benefits and taxes. So you can see before uh, COVID in 2018, we we're at about an 11% poverty, child poverty rate in the state. Um, I put up this map, which is using a slightly older data, but um, just to show you that there's a lot of variation in poverty rates across the country. Um, we know about some of this variation, poverty um, varies by uh, family structure, it varies by race and ethnicity, it varies by immigration status, and certainly it varies by geography. So um, you can see uh, uh, the variation there. Um, we know, for example, uh, that families uh, from African American families and Hispanic families uh, con pretty consistently have higher rates of poverty. Um, also, poverty rates among Native American children are much higher. Um, than non-Hispanic whites and also immigrants um, have, uh, uh, are more likely to be poor. Um, if you look regionally, um, the South is sort of um, the, the poorest region in the country. Um, so there's a lot of concern about child poverty. Um, it's too high, it's a problem, um, but what can we do about it? The good news is that we've cut it in half before. 
Um, so this is part of a, a report that I'm gonna talk about in just a second, um, but just to preview that we have some opportunities here and we can do something about this. So I wanna talk a little bit about why we need to care about poverty uh, in children and what are some of the harms and the different levels of harms that can occur. Um, so there is quite a body of research, um, which many of my colleagues have been involved in and, and many uh, across the country, but we know that poverty in childhood is associated with a lot of different, all the outcomes listed here um, in the health domains, um, adverse childhood experience and child maltreatment, um, different cognitive skills, language, memory, self-regulation, regula <clears throat> um, mental health, decreased educational attainment, um, and increased risky behavior. So just across all sorts of domains, uh, which is problematic. And of course, the other problem is that if one experiences poverty in childhood, um, there's also a greater likelihood that they'll have poor outcomes as an adult. And again, uh, we see this across a lot of different domains, lower earnings and income, um, higher dependence on public assistance, more health problems, uh, more likelihood of committing crimes. And the other thing that we know is that uh, these outcomes, poorer outcomes are exacerbated when children uh, live in poor families in early childhood. So a lot of um, looking at the zero to five age range, which of course is of great interest here, um, when they spend a substantial part of childhood in poverty, so sort of the longevity that they're experiencing it, and then the degree of poverty, so especially experiencing deep poverty. The other thing I wanna talk about really briefly is that um, poverty, it's really important to talk about the systemic causes and consequences of poverty. Um, so a lot of times we talk about poverty from sort of an individual perspective or a parental perspective or an individual child perspective. And while that's certainly important, um, poverty definitely has uh, both systemic causes. Um, so we can think about things like how segregation matters, how neighborhoods matter, how access to public benefits matter. Um, and it also has implications for uh, the quality of life in our communities and in our different systems. And so I think that that's a really important uh, point and, and something for us to think about and why we need to invest in reducing child poverty. And finally, um, because uh, I am a good student of Dennis Winters and all the economists here at uh, UW, um, I certainly think it's important to talk about the cost that child poverty has for society. Um, so again, this is um, from a report that I'll talk about uh, that was done by the National Academies um, that roughly between 800 billion and $1.1 trillion um, is what childhood poverty, and this was a report, um, you know, this came out in 2019. So um, it's probably higher than that now. Um, and if we think about why um, we're looking at increased costs um, due to crime, due to uh, lost adult productivity, increased health expenditures, all of these things, again, um, can be traced back to not dealing with childhood poverty. And, and one thing I want to come back to, I'm going to talk about some programs, and you may have a reaction, Ooh, that's quite a price tag, um, or um, the policy, how, how do we pay for that? Again, I want to come back to everything I'm going to present here is a very tiny drop in the bucket uh, compared to these costs that we're incurring um, as a society because of child poverty. So I want to talk about a report that was done, um, again, right before COVID hit, um, but uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Tim Smeeting, and several of our colleagues at our partner um, poverty centers across the country um, we're part of a, a committee on building an agenda to reduce the number of children in poverty by half in 10 years. Um, so that was the goal. So they wanted to reduce poverty by about 6.5 percentage points. They wanted to look at existing um, policies and programs, and they wanted to think about some innovations within that structure that kind of already exists um, in our country. Uh, so this was a report that was released in 2019. It was requested by Congress. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that um, if we look at, uh, if we have a starting rate, a national starting rate of child poverty of about 13% at this time, um, what this graph is showing is what would happen if we took away the entire social safety net, or if we took away each of these uh, individual programs that contribute to the social safety net. 
So for example, if we took away all of these programs that we're talking about here, the childhood poverty rate would be about 30% or one out of three, um, uh, which is incredible. So the good news there is that these programs are having an impact. Um, you can see that um, the EITC, um, which uh, uh, again was talked about already today, um, is, is one of the strongest contributors uh, as an anti uh, poverty program. And then SNAP, which is uh, formerly called Food Stamps, um, is the second most and has quite a bit of reach. Um, the other thing I just want to point out here is that, you know, some of the programs that we've traditionally maybe talked about, like temporary assistance for needy families, has become so small, it's even, you know, just kind of grouped in um, and is not providing, um, you know, a lot of, of poverty relief at this time. So again, like I said, the goal of this uh, committee and the goal of this report was to try to figure out how could we cut child poverty in half in 10 years. Um, so that was the goal. Um, and they looked at 20 different programs and um, they essentially, um, some of the lessons that they learned, right? And these are um, a lot of economists, um, sociologists, uh, you know, some different uh, folks from different um, uh, areas of, of the academic uh, spectrum. Um, but they were looking at 20 different programs and policies. And one of the very important lessons learned right away is that there's no silver bullet. There's no one policy that's going to do the trick. Um, a $3,000 per year uh, child allowance, so that would be like a monthly cash payment to families for each child living in the home would come the closest. Um, they figured that would reduce poverty by about 5.3 percentage points. Um, and it would fully meet the goal of reducing deep poverty by half. Um, but they figured out pretty quickly we're going to need some kind of um, combination of package. And certainly there are a lot of other factors to consider here, right? Like what's palatable, um, uh, you know, to society? How, what do we value? Um, so they're looking at, again, sort of a combination of work-oriented programs and policies and also income support-oriented programs and policies. So this is um, a, a table that kind of shows some of the different ways that they work to combine um, what they thought might work, all four of the packages, and, and this is based on, um, you know, different research that have been done on, on each of the programs. Um, and you can see uh, that um, it, there are four packages, um, two of them um, are going to meet the goal, all of them are going to reduce uh, poverty by quite a bit. So I'll just highlight the two that actually met their goal. Um, so the first one um, is a package that combines means-tested means supports and work supports. Um, so this package would expand four existing programs. So increased payments under the EITC, which has been very um, successful um, along the phase in and flat out portions in particular. Convert the child and dependent care tax credit to a fully refundable tax credit. Um, and that's so um, it can reach um, families that were not eligible for that because of their very low incomes. And we'll, we'll talk about how uh, we got to sort of experiment with that under um, the expanded child care tax credit in just a minute. Um, increased SNAP benefits by quite a bit and increased benefits for older children in summer programs. And then finally, increase the number of housing vouchers directed to families with children. Um, right now, housing vouchers um, really only impact a very small number of eligible families. Um, so this was seen as, as something that could be very stabilizing um, and, and reduce poverty. So you can see the, the estimated cost of the package. Um, you know, again, a goal would be to increase earnings and another goal is to increase jobs. Um, and so this package met all of those criteria. The second package is a combination of uh, universal supports and work. So this combines uh, different work incentives, economic security, and also took a perspective on it's important to have social inclusion strategies. So this involves um, a little less targeting um, in terms of like means tested programs and more universal programs that might touch um, kind of all children. So in, to, again, sort of thinking about what's palatable, what, you know, how, do, what do, how do we benefit from universal uh, programs as well. Um, so this again increased the AITC. That's going to be a theme today, um, <laughs> I think, um, across the entire tax schedule and keeping um, the current range in the phase out section, converting that child um, tax credit to fully refundable. So very much like the last one. 
Um, but also including raising the current federal minimum wage to $10.25 and then indexing it to inflation afterwards. Um, restoring eligibility for a number of the means tested programs for legal immigrants. Um, and then these two, the next two um, are, you know, programs that are not in place but have been proposed um, and would take advantage of sort of the systems that we already have but um, make the eligibility and, and, and the implementation of them a bit different. So creating a new child allowance um, that pays a monthly benefit of $225 per month to families of all children um, and would also be paid to legal immigrants. And then finally, a child support assurance policy. Um, so this means that if the non-custodial parent did not pay their child support, no matter what, the family would get sort of a backup amount, uh, a minimum of $100 per month. So again, you can see the estimated cost, change in earnings and change in jobs, but um, some creative ways to sort of work within the system um, to really make a big impact. Now, I'm gonna move to, again, that, that came out you know, right before COVID um, hit. And, and there was a lot of energy around it. And then um, because of COVID um, in the American uh, Rescue Plan, we actually had a chance to test um, what would happen with some of the uh, more innovative parts of, of um, this proposal. And specifically, I wanna talk about the expanded child tax credit. And I wanna give um, uh, props to our colleagues at Columbia University um, and their Center for Social Policy who've done some really great work in giving us some sort of real time um, research on this. And I have, um, I have the sources at the bottom of all these slides and encourage you to, to check it out. But essentially the expanded tax credit, um, we have, uh, we're giving families more money um, based on child age. So kids at, at um, the youngest children, families with the youngest children get a little bit more. Uh, we change the tax credit from an annual credit to a monthly set of payments. And again, we expand and make it fully refundable so that all low-income families can participate. And again, the goal is to make life more affordable and stable, especially um, during a uh, time of duress during COVID. Um, there's been quite a bit of, of research um, already, like I said, um, uh, from Columbia and others that um, suggest that, that this was an extremely successful anti-poverty program. Um, and interestingly, um, so there's great mixed methods research on this, and we've talked about the importance of um, making sure that we are including lived experience um, when we're doing this kind of work, when we're developing policies and, and researching policies. And, and um, this includes um, both, uh, you know, great analysis around the numbers, um, but also talking with families about what this meant to them. Um, so families, you know, really use the money for basic needs and important we um, used it a lot to pay for childcare. Um, and again, the link uh, to employment, because one of the concerns about a policy like this is that, oh, we're gonna disincentivize employment, but that's actually not at all what happened. Um, uh, again, parents are, are using it um, you know, for kids and, and to buy higher quality childcare. Um, also using it to pay down debt and increase savings. And also really seeing it as an opportunity to build skills in financial management and sort of how do we think about um, you know, this, this windfall and how, you know, what do we do with it? Um, and also um, you know, had very um, blunt and um, impactful um, results on things like food insecurity, um, ability to afford household expenses, again, savings, and really did decrease child poverty by quite a bit, both rates and volatility. Um, so by December 2021, it was keeping 3.7 million children out of poverty, um, which is incredible. Um, and it had especially um, large impacts for Blacks, uh, Latinx population, and rural populations. And if we think about um, you know, rural populations that may not have access to some of the, you know, maybe in childcare deserts or don't have access to some of other programs, um, you know, this is a way <laughs> you know, to kind of uh, diffuse or infuse, sorry, um, uh, you know, some, some help right away. Um, but as we all know, um, the child tax credit, expanded child tax credit um, went away in December and Columbia is continuing to um, look at this and there has been, uh, you know, in pretty instantaneous and increased hardship um, following the expiration. So um, something to think about. 
it leads me to um, talk a little bit more about um, uh, some of the other programs that are related to this idea of, you know, how do we, again, sort of um, provide this upstream, uh, potential upstream assistance for families and what can they do if they have, um, you know, money to sort of stabilize their family, um, family welfare. So one movement right now, um, uh, an initiative across the country is guaranteed um, income program. So some of you may have heard about these. Um, this is a map. There's an organization called Mayors for Guaranteed Income. So this is more of a city led um, uh, type intervention. Um, there are three programs that are in planning stages in Wisconsin. So um, we have one in Madison and I'm really excited. IRP um, is a part of that. Um, also, uh, there's planning in Wausau and Milwaukee, but um, there are, I think we were up to about 27 programs um, so far in the country um, growing by leaps and bounds. So the way uh, the, these are um, based on uh, the original guaranteed income program was in Stockton, California, called the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration or SEED. So this was launched in February of 2019 uh, by former mayor Michael D. Tubbs, who is also the founder of, of Mayors for Guaranteed Income, and essentially uh, raised money philanthropically and, and through the city and other things um, with businesses, um, you know, working and really presented this as an investment in that community. Um, so it was giving 125 Stockton residents $500 per month for 24 months. Um, again, most of these are run as experiments, so that's um, really great a way for us to learn from them because um, that's sort of the most rigorous kind of research that you can do. Um, this is an unconditional cash transfer, so um, it's literally families get the cash, they can spend it on whatever they choose to spend it on. Um, and so uh, the other thing I want to talk about is that um, a lot of these programs really come at this from a philosophical perspective of um, social and economic justice. Um, that it's in, and again, community investment. That this is a, a community level investment that we need to make a change. Um, that everyone deserves to, um, you know, be able to uh, sort of live a life without poverty, um, inequality, and volatility. So. A lot of these um, programs are still in the experimental stage. So that's why it's, it's really fun to come here today to talk about, um, uh, you know, kind of some of the things going on here, but they do have their first year findings um, are out from Stockton. So um, just to talk a little bit about the program um, and, and a lot of these programs now are, are talking about different kinds of eligibility, but for the Stockton program, you had to be at least 18 years old. You had to reside in the community and live in a neighborhood with a median income at or below $46,033. So again, um, it's kind of interesting that this is thinking about um, poverty from a community perspective and a neighborhood perspective um, versus an individual perspective. And so um, uh, just to talk about the initial results, um, they found reduced income volatility. So in other words, um, sort of the fluctuations that families experience month month. Um, I think that's really important to talk about. We often talk about, you know, sort of overall income or annual income, but volatility matters a lot. And we, um, some of the child support research we do, um, you know, really looks at this, but um, volatility is important because it can, if you have, you know, a bad month, a family has, or, a new, or an emergency or something like that, um, that can often set off a spiral of events that are really problematic. So you have something like an eviction, because um, you can't pay rent. You have car repairs that you can't make, so you can't get to work, um, you know, different things like that. So, um, so I, I, I think it's important for us to, you know, not only just think about that sort of annual income lens, but, you know, how do families experience poverty um, and the volatility there? So this had um, obvious, uh, for obvious reasons, had um, reduced that for the families in Stockton. It also enabled fam recipients to find full-time employment. So again, uh, you know, that continues to be a concern that programs like guaranteed income programs or other unconditional cash tran transfers could disincentivize work. And so that's very much on the minds of the designers of these programs and thinking about um, and measuring uh, the impacts on employment. And again, um, so far the tendency has shown that in, uh, alternatively it allows 
um, families to sort of stabilize, look for better work, um, and get better childcare so that they can um, work more hours. Um, and then finally, recipients were healthier and showed less depression and anxiety and enhanced well being, um, and also um, had a psychological impact. Um, in other words, uh, alleviated this financial scarcity. Um, so, new opportunities for self determination, choice, goal setting, and risk taking. So, uh, just to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of where do we go from here um, and what's next in guaranteed income research. Um, I was really excited. I'm very excited. Like I said, uh, we have a program that's going to be starting up in Madison later this year uh, that I'm sure this group will be interested in because there is a focus on families with children. Um, so the eligibility here will be um, less than 200% above the poverty level and at least one child in the home. Um, and there are a lot of variations around the country. We just had a traveling scholar, um, a visiting scholar, um, at IRP last week, um, Lucius Kula, who is doing some work in Gainesville, Florida, where they are targeting um, formerly incarcerated individuals with their guaranteed income program. So I'm really looking forward to watching that research develop and seeing what happens um, with that population as well. There are also um, experiments around different amounts of income. So what, you know, what makes the difference? What matters? Um, there's uh, the Bridge Project in New York City. Um, uh, that I appreciate Jane Pennerhoppy uh, pointed out to me. Um, and this is really interestingly looking at different amounts and again in early childhood. So really kind of focusing on that time of life and what matters. Um, and the other thing I think we need to know more about these programs is sort of what are the long-term findings? And especially if they're limited programs for one year. Um, and we know from the, for example, from the expanded child um, tax credit that um, you know, when there's that cutoff, there can be an immediate um, you know, detriment to families. So how do we think about sort of offboarding or what do we think about like what comes next um, after a program like this? Or what do we think about, um, uh, you know, how do we develop policies and programs where we, you know, that, that maybe put things in place? Um, we don't know, um, you know, it could be that one year is, is great. And then there is stable, you know, there, there's ability, um, you know, to get better employment, to connect with better childcare, to do other things. We just have to do some more work kind of in the long term and, and link to some administrative data and watch that. Okay, so an, um, another related uh, program that's kind of like a guaranteed income program, but it's um, kind of a different branding and a different idea um, is the program that Secretary Amundsen um, referred to earlier, which is called Baby's First Years. And this is a really cool um, experiment um, that I'm very excited. Our director, uh, Professor Catherine Magnuson, is one of the principal investigators on. Um, they're principal investigators across um, a lot of different um, uh, a lot of different universities and a lot of different um, in, uh, intellectual domains. But the basic experimental test, again, this is a randomized controlled trial, so it's really telling us like, um, you know, does, does this program cause change? It's kind of the best thing we can do. It's not just an association, right? It's making a difference or not. Um, does an unconditional cash gift of $333 a month, so very policy relevant, very close to what, um, for example, the child care tax credit, the EITC, a lot of different things. Um, in early childhood, does it support young children's healthy development and brain function? Does it improve family functioning and better enable parents to care for their children? And there are really um, kind of two mechanisms that they're trying to look at. Um, so one is led by the economists on the team, which is, um, are we able to invest more in children, right? So, um, you know, can, can mothers buy um, things that help their children uh, develop, right? Um, and then the other is reduce stress. So does, you know, does having more financial stability um, enable better parenting, right, and better family well-being. Um, so each mother, so um, th there's a, a lot of innovation in the study, and they literally, you know, come up with an eligibility um, list, and they go to hospitals um, and uh, recruit moms um, who have just had children, um, that they are given a debt card branded for my baby, um, this is a philanthropical gift. So this is privately um, raised money. 
Um, it is not taxable and to the extent possible does not count against benefits. Now, this is really important um, for a policy audience because um, there are concerns that these programs put people over benefits cliffs, right? And then they can't access some of the other things. So that's a really important other consideration as we think about different policy solutions and how they interact with our existing policies, like how that's really important. Um, so they worked with you know, state legislatures, um, city programs uh, to make sure that families wouldn't be uh, put in harm that way. Um, the sample is low income moms, um, so about $22,000 500 annual household income. So this is a significant amount of money um, for these families in the locations that the families are in is New York City, New Orleans, Twin Cities, and Omaha. Um, so this is a timeline of, uh, and I'm, I'm not so interested in the timeline as I am in just showing you kind of the different types of information that um, the investigators are collecting with this program because it really shows us, again, sort of how do we think about income and family's financial situation and what is impacted and what we should be measuring and how we think about um, uh, you know, what, what is being impacted. So um, all of the moms uh, started this, the, the, um, it, the experiment started before COVID. Um, so they did an in-person survey with mom about um, you know, a lot of different socioeconomic and demographic type data. Um, and then they did something really cool, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, so they do some things like observation of parent-child interactions. Um, so again, sort of thinking about that, that parenting piece, um, they look at maternal stress and they look at child brain activity. So I'll, I'll show you a picture in a minute, but um, you know, one of the things we talk about when we were doing research and thinking about being more inclusive and culturally responsive in our research and making sure that we're doing research in a way that is available um, to families and that we can make sure that we're actually involving families in this. So um, it's, it's literally um, uh, putting, uh, bringing EEG technology into the home. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, then COVID hit, um, that made this very sort of um, intense in-home uh, kind of delivery um, and data gathering very difficult, but they did continue to do phone surveys um, you can kind of see where they are in their data collection right now. And very importantly, at age four, um, they plan to do um, child lab assessments. So they will do some direct cognitive testing um, and also look at child brain activity again. So again, this is a program that's very much um, still uh, in the field. Um, and, and there hasn't been a lot, a lot of the results haven't been published yet because they're still collecting and analyzing. But the one thing that they have published so far, which maybe you saw in the New York Times, or I think um, maybe was included in some of the pre-materials, that they do have the brain development findings from year one. And so this is a picture of uh, one of the children, um, uh, you know, with the in-home uh, EEG on uh, their head. Um, and it's just a really innovative um, opportunity uh, to do this kind of work. And why do we care? So how does brain, how does poverty reduction even impact the developing brain? Why, you know, why do we think it would? Um, there's some evidence that suggests that higher frequency brain activity. So, you know, waves, if it, if it were to play out on the thing, it's like the waves are more, you know, like closer together, right? Um, increases as one ages and learns. Um, so that suggests that that's, that's a good thing. We want higher frequency brain activity. Um, but there's some uh, previous evidence that suggests that lower socioeconomic status um, is associated with more lower frequent activity, lower frequency activity. Um, so it suggests that poverty can have an impact, again, on brain development. And this is linked to, for example, um, outcomes that have to do with language, cognitive, and emotional scores, right? Um, so in babies' first years, they did find indeed that the high cash gift group, so the, the group that got $333 um, a, a month, and I should say the other group got 20, the, the control group, um, did have statistically significantly more high frequency brain activity, including in specific regions of the brain. Um, so this is still very experimental. Um, and I think, you know, the next step is that they really want to say, okay, so we found these, this difference in brain development, but does it really, is it really linked to difference in cognitive outcomes? And that's sort of the next step um, when, they get, when the kids get to age four. 
Um, the last innovation I wanna talk about is something called baby bonds. Um, and um, this, I also want to uh, sort of bring in the idea of not just income, which is sort of a narrow lens for us to think about poverty, but also the idea of wealth. So baby bonds or baby trusts, um, this is an idea that's really a response to structural inequality. So what this graph is showing you um, is the difference by race and wealth in the United States. Um, and when I say wealth, what I'm talking about, um, at least as measured on this graph, is all financial and non-financial assets minus total household liabilities or debts. Um, and there are enormous disparities in wealth, um, especially by race. So, um, you know, you can see here uh, the difference. Um, so just to kind of give you some, pull out some numbers, typical wealth of a black family is about $17,000. Um, and for a white family is $170,000. Um, uh, again, median household wealth um, held by the poorest white households goes in the bottom 20th percent of the income distribution, generally higher than the median wealth held by black households in any income bracket. So there are some things going on here. Um, and, uh, and, and why is wealth important versus just income? Um, you know, wealth has to do with the ability, um, it can be transformational, right? Um, it can uh, provide access to college, um, to uh, owning a business, um, family tran trans, um, transfer of wealth is very important. Owning a home, a lot of this is driven by home ownership um, and differences in home ownership amongst these groups. Um, so it is something that we need to think about. And um, one of the premises underlying baby bonds and the proposals that have come out there um, are that government policies have contributed to these disparities historically and over time. And so how can we think about that and how do we impact it? So baby, um, baby bonds, um, the idea is that uh, these are trust accounts funded by the federal government and provided to every newborn infant. So you can kind of think about it um, a little bit like what is the, so, you know, we have social security um, for old age. So what do we, what do, we do um, sort of universally for kids um, when they're born? And that's really what the idea is. Um, it would provide substantial assets to young adults who would otherwise not have the financial means to pursue things like buying a house or going to college or starting a business um, without going into debt. And then, again, it serves as a vehicle for those who have weaker ties to the financial system, especially children who are born into families uh, that, that grew up without assets or wealth. Um, and just to talk about some of the proposed, this is really of all the things I've presented so far are very much, this is very much still mostly a proposal. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of active programs, right? Uh, there was a program um, in the United Kingdom back in the early 2000s, a child trust fund. Um, in the United States, this idea has been um, the kind of the, the um, the strongest leaders and proponents of this kind of a policy have been William Darity and Derek Hamilton. So I think uh, we sent uh, Derek's uh, TED talk um, is something that you could take a look at where he talks about sort of the premise behind this idea and what it would mean. Um, but again, it's really kind of based on this idea that wealth is the paramount indicator of economic security and well being, and it can be very meaningful for families and children. Um, this would be a universal approach as they talk about it. So every child in the United States would have a baby trust fund. Um, now that the amount that is put into the trust fund uh, would vary quite a bit um, based on family income. And you can see some of the, the range there um, and that these would be put into federal accounts with a guaranteed uh, annual return of at least 2%, um, you know, thinking to at least cover inflation, for example. Um, so that proposal has kind of been out there. And, and again, the, the folks who are leading that charge um, uh, are very much, very much think it needs, to, importantly, needs to be a universal, um, uh, you know, type of, type of policy. Um, fairly recent, or 2020, Senator Cory Booker um, put out the idea of the American Opportunity Accounts Act, which um, is a little bit different take that, um, Families would start with a thousand, children would start with a thousand dollars and then add up to two thousand dollars a year via the tax code. 
um, managed by U.S. Treasury, and again, that there would be some limitations on how this is spent um, at age 18. So again, proposal, thought, um, very interesting. Um, the one thing I will say, I don't know a lot about Connecticut's program, but um, what I did find um, is that there is a state that seems to be experimenting with this um, in real time, uh, which is Connecticut. So they enroll based on a birth covered by their Medicaid program. Um, and then uh, up to $3,200 is deposited in that baby bond trust and invested by the Office of the State Treasurer. And then at 18, beneficiaries can use the funds um, to invest in a business, buy a home, pay for higher education, or save for retirement. So again, this is a one to watch, right? Okay, um, oh, sorry, I, uh, I apologize. I didn't uh, um, forward that before, but there's the slide about Connecticut and there's the link. So um, to sum up, you know, what can we learn and what do we think about across all these different programs and policies? Uh, what lessons can we think about? Um, I think it's pretty clear we have pretty good information that child poverty invokes harm at a lot of different levels, individual, family, community, and societal, but that there are investments that we can make. We know we can cut child poverty. We've done it before, um, and there are a lot of promising practices and policies that we can invest in. Um, we know that this shift that we've had from guaranteed income supports to more of a work-based safety net makes it difficult for some families to invest or to access benefits and that some of these programs may not address the generational and racially driven disparities that we see and we need to, uh, to work on. Uh, furthermore, modest amounts of money can make a difference. Um, so we're looking at payments of like $250 a month, $300 a month that really do um, uh, make an impact across a lot of different domains. But we also should think about income volatility as something to address and also wealth. Um, and finally, there's no single silver bullet. Um, in any of these, that it's going to take a combination. And again, all of this combined with really high quality early child care and education um, uh, and, and working on those for families as well. Um, but there's some interesting public-private partnership opportunities and uh, thinking about working at different levels of government. Um, and, you know, I hope we can play a role in continuing to help to evaluate um, and help us invest our resources as, as we can. So thank you. Thank you so much, Hillary. Um, I think you've got all of our, our brains um, in spiral mode here, um, but it feels, it feels really highly relevant and it feels very cutting edge to be having a conversation like this um, about, you know, truly what is emerging right now, what is being tested and, and certainly very exciting uh, to know that Wisconsin in many ways is on, you, you know, is on the edge of some of that, either the actually testing of some of these strategies um, or evaluating them uh, through some of our, um, our, our key researchers at IRP. Um, also, just, just yesterday, Governor's Health Equity Council uh, voted on a number of recommendations that they plan to include in, in their plan. And uh, among them, I believe a universal approach to baby bonds was one of the uh, proposals that was, um, that was voted um, up, a, as well as a proposal around the earned income tax credit. So, um, so right here in our own, um, you know, in one of the governor's own councils focused on on this, we're connecting those dots between what does it mean to be truly well as a family in the broad sense, and then what are the, the sort of um, impacts, the ripple effects on, uh, you know, on the individual family, the members of the family, the children in the family, and then let's go macro, you know, on Wisconsin and its, and its long-term economic health, its workforce, its, uh, its, its general, um, you know, dominance as a, as a state like as as one of the best states probably the best state um so i think uh i want to go over to i see governor evers put a um put a, an incendiary comment in the chat um i think he picked up on the same tension that i did uh which is that um there's this sort of chicken egg uh question that i think you're asking governor and i don't know if you want to elaborate um a little bit on it but it was something i was thinking a little bit too about the tension between sort of dennis's um first presentation around like folks it's early childhood that's the difference maker here kind of 
uh, buttress up against some of the emerging um, things that we're seeing come out of um, Hillary's presentation around, well, maybe we need to start with a, you know, a broader brush approach around poverty. Is that where you were going with your comment, Governor? Yeah, and I, and I, I put it in the context of um, uh, criminal behavior, because that is uh, a top issue for lots of people in the state and the country. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, the knee-jerk reaction is to either get tougher on crime or put more people away or have more police officers and all that. And all those things may have may play a role. But the, the, the question I pose, and it is not an either, either or, but is it, it, you know, because we've seen it in both places now, where, where uh, uh, reduction of criminal behavior uh, is, is directly related to wealth of, of families and, uh, you know, or is early childhood allowing uh, men and women both to get into the workforce, create more family wealth, more family wealth means less criminal behavior. Um, uh, or is it the actual early childhood program itself? And I think that what came out of the Perry study is that uh, uh, that, that self-regulating behavior and is, uh, is, a, is a top priority for early childhood education. So I, the question is, is it either or? And obviously the answer is both. But it, it's, it's an important thing right now because when we see a problem, criminal behavior is something that people perceive as a problem now. I think it's more than just perception. The knee-jerk reaction is to do something quick. Now, boom, it's, it's over and now it's fixed. And uh, uh, I haven't heard anybody talking about early childhood education in that context in the last two years. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the comment. Dennis, I see um, I, I see you said yes, it's both. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? I, I, I can. Um, it is both and it's in combination and it's kind of a, you know, a short run and a long run. I mean, part of it is, and, and I don't know so much about the, you know, psychology or anything about it like that. But um, what I do know is that the evidence has shown that a lot of the returns on investment for quality early childhood uh, uh, investment has been uh, discipline and uh, uh, self-discipline and motivation, which are two key drivers uh, in, in anybody's achievement going forward, if not the two, the two big ones. Um, but then in combination, if you have early childhood uh, care that the, the kids are getting, they will be future uh, contributors uh, to society. And in the meantime, yes, you are increasing the economics by having productive workers on the website and that combination or on the website, on the work site. So that combination, right, has positive feedback loops within the economic context. Uh, so yes, it's, it, it's, I would say it's both. And, and a lot of times we, what I call, you know, we, we shoot, we shoot the thing up with with silver plated bullets. I mean, we don't have a silver bullet and we just shoot it up with silver plated bullets. So, but you need a, everybody's got an idea, but you need a systemic, right? Uh, wide ranging uh, approach um, that's sustainable. Thanks. Hillary, any comments on that? I would just agree it's both. And, and um, you know, some of the exciting research in early childhood right now is um, you know, we've done a good job of measuring sort of academic outcomes, right? So like test scores or educational attainment, things like that. Now there's a little more emphasis on sort of looking at socio-emotional skills and things like impacts. And, and we know, for example, like impacts on uh, retention or impacts on, uh, you know, being a potentially over um, identified um, in, in special education or different things like that, or um, impacts on self-regulation um, and behavior. Um, you know, that we're thinking about that. So that's another um, angle within there as well. Yep, I see you, Peter. Did you want to comment on this one? Yes, I wanted to ask Hillary, you know, it, it, it occurred to me uh, during your presentation, Hillary, when you talk about the, the cost benefit and, you know, of, of, of many of the anti-poverty measures or early childhood education and, and clearly, uh, it's, the evidence is overwhelming, but do we factor in with the governor's point of, 
you know, the cost of incarceration, does that enter into the equation or is that something that's harder to calculate? Because clearly when you look at all those various items that you put together, which are very impressive, everything from health outcomes to mental health challenges, to um, increased wages, to increased, you know, family satisfaction. Uh, I just wonder if that's part of the equation when you, when you look at that. And so it's definitely a part of the equation of um, what, what Dennis was talking about, right? Like, it, yeah, I mean, those cost benefit analyses that um, have, uh, you know, um, followed uh, kids for decades, um, they absolutely are, are putting that cost of incarceration. In fact, that's one of the, honestly, that's one of the main drivers um, mm. of, of some of the savings there. Very good, thank you. And Linda, I see your hand raised and then Curtis, you're on deck. Yeah, um, as someone who's been around for a long time and um, seeing that the investment in preschool is just never what we would like it to be to to re to achieve the, the success that we know could be there. Um, I, I just want to add into the conversation the the research that's been done on saying that um, the type of uh, method that you use, if it's more universally accepted, if people from across the um, economic spectrum see this as something that's valuable, it's more likely to um, be supported over the long term. And so Hillary's, you know, listed a couple of different things that would be more broad based. And, you know, if we have to choose where we're investing our energy and efforts, I I'm just saying we should consider that as a factor in, the in that decision. Thanks for the comment. Curtis. Hey, I, I have two questions. Um, one is the first, uh, probably to Dennis, but um, one of the concerns I have right now is when we look at Medicaid and not expanding Medicaid, we're actually reducing the productive capacity of our workforce. Um, a calculation, like, I mean, I think there's about 20,000 people could work up to the Medicaid expansion limit. We'd get about 12 million more work hours or caregiver hours um, th there. And the phenomenon that is now more concerning to me is the actually as inflation increases wages and the um, income levels or the qualification levels for Medicaid aren't going up, is that actually reducing uh, for people that want to maintain their uh, Medicaid, uh, is that reducing people participating in the workforce? So that's one phenomenon I was thinking about through these presentations. The other one is with 50% of the babies being delivered under Medicaid. Um, Hillary, did you, are there any states that looked at the 39 states that have expanded Medicaid to see as, as that is a positive intervention for reducing poverty and increasing childhood success. So. Do you want to go first, Dennis? No. <laughs> okay. Um, I yeah. I um, the the answer to your question is there research being done about um, Medicaid expansion? Absolutely. Um, and what I've seen of it, I'm not going to say I'm a, an expert on it, but. Um, definitely seems to be having positive impacts um, across, again, sort of a lot of different domains. Um, and we had a, a speaker, um, I'll, I'm going to find that and I'm going to send this to you, Curtis, um, but looked at um, Medicaid expansion as um, a strategy in a cost benefit analysis kind of way um, and found it to be a positive intervention um, at early childhood in particular. So I will look for that for you and, and try to find it. His name is escaping my brain at the moment, but yeah, a lot of work around there. Um, and Dennis, I guess I would look to you to talk about impacts on workforce. My, my guess is yes, that, that there's some work out there. Well, yeah, and I'm not um, all that uh, familiar with all the specific work that's been going on along those lines, but, you know, just kind of from an economic perspective, anything you can do to low, lower the barriers to entry, right, for employment or, or you know, civil function um, is going to be positive uh, because of the costs involved in the alternatives. So, and I, I, I couldn't comment on what the returns are on that. I'm sure there's a number of studies out there that have shown, you know, um, analysis along those lines, but. 
Great, thank you. Uh, I want to invite anybody else who has either a question or a comment uh, on any of the presentations to um, to weigh in. What are you going to take away from uh, any of what you, you heard here today? Anything um, particularly resonant or something that you had not heard before? Interested in any of that feedback? So Emily, I would just say that um, uh, Peter's comment about the number of uh, child care slots being more than pre-pandemic, I should know that. You know, I read your stuff all the time, but I think there's so much um, in the media about the crisis around it that you lose track of um, the progress that has been made and all the work that you folks did to achieve that progress. Thanks, Linda. Anything else that you want to take away from this or carry with you? Yes. Um, let's see, is that uh, Catherine? Yes, hi. Um, first of all, I thought all the presentations were great and I learned a few things that I thought I already knew. Um, I just wanted to share an anecdotal story from my own experience. Um, I, I give, I've brought this up many times in meetings um, about the workforce, um, child care. I worked in DC for 16 years before I came back home to Wisconsin. And in DC, almost every federal agency has a child care center in the building. And when I was pregnant, I worked at the State Department and my division was being moved to a, a new building. So that I was lucky I got on the list right away. And what a difference it is, um, because the first few months it wasn't ready after I had my child, so I had to drive her far out. It was a real hassle, but then when we were in the building, it was wonderful because I could commute with her and talk to her, um, visit her during lunch, and you know, if I had to work late, I would go down, get her, and bring her up, and it, it was wonderful, and I, I really think if people realized what an impact that would have on families, um, and, you know, they're workers. I'm not sure if I could have worked um, if I didn't have that close by like that. So I hope even the state as we maybe reorganize our, you know, if there are changes after the pandemic, new buildings or space becoming available, we consider that. It was a private company that ran it, but they leased space from the department. Thanks, Catherine. And just to, um, just to provide one more example, I was just at a, um, a, a state peer-to-peer -peer meeting and um, found out that there are several southern states that are um, piloting programs where um, families can actually bring their, um, their little one to work up to, to six months of age um, in state departments, in, uh, in state agencies. And these are Southern states, folks. Uh, so I, I think um, really my jaw dropped um, at, at the thought that, um, that state agencies were, um, were piloting these kinds of family friendly policies uh, across the country. So um, any well, other last thoughts? Let's not berate yeah. those Southern states too badly, right? Um, so, but <laughs> I've got relatives down there. But North Carolina has been a leader actually in early childhood development through for the last couple of decades. Um, so they got it, they got it early and they've done uh, pretty marvelous things down there. Thanks. Any other last comments? I'll, I'll invite one more comment. If somebody has something, I see uh, a few folks have put things in the chat. Practicing my teacher wait time here. All right. Well, yeah, mean, go ahead, and, 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 and Yeah, just, just if I may, I mean, I it's I think what we've demonstrated today, kind of with with the group and the and the and the and the everybody you've brought together here, um, and and in kind of you know in reference to the governor's comment, yeah, it is 
it is a systemic thing. I mean, we've got all these departments, interests, and everything co connecting the dots, right? Uh, is is a model you've got to take on a lot of this stuff. And can it be public and private partnerships and such and so forth? So I, I think, like I say, again, a systemic approach um, is much is going to work much better, you know, in the whole economic realm of it, as the feedback loops are taken advantage of as we go forward to this. And 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 yeah, I, I I I I just accentuate my frustration that this just isn't, you know, routine anymore. Um, thank you. Yep, thank you. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah. I'll just add one more point that, you know, as I travel around the state, and mainly I mean with chambers and economic development professionals and people of that sort, but they have a lot of influence on state policy. And the one thing, I think we're in sort of a golden position now because so much of the focus is on workforce. And as we heard from, you know, Dennis and Hillary and others that, you know, we have a big part of the equation to help to solve that issue. And that to the degree to which we can tie together these strategies, which will help enormously with workforce at the same time, is it will help us in terms of positive outcomes for, for children and the long-term uh, benefits for the state. I think we need to tie that together perhaps a little bit more cleanly and, and put together maybe some additional coherent kinds of messages that we could all be sharing together so that they're hearing many voices coming at this and talking about, you know, the, uh, the symmetry of how we can solve a couple problems at once. And of course, that's part of the governor's whole goal of connecting the dots. And, and that's why I think these sessions are particularly effective. But I think that we need to, I think there's more that we can do in that regard and in that space. So I'm going to challenge our team to give a little more thought to that, and we'll put together some additional slides, and we'll send those over your way, Emily, as well, and maybe we can share them with everybody. I, I love that idea, and I, I've long thought that this this conversation about early childhood gets um, messy really quickly, and and sometimes can have the effect of decamping people. You know, um, either I care about the quality aspect for the child, or I care about the workforce aspect because of the economy and um, and it gets kind of complicated kind of quickly and um, and so to Peter's point like I think we we do have a moment right here where people have whether you're a parent or whether you're a business leader or uh, um, an employer you felt personally some of the pain of the last two years um, from that from that uh, lack of childcare perspective and um, and so I think we have this moment to get the message right and um, I think uh, what I love about um, what we've heard here today is these are folks that don't eat, sleep, breathe, you know, childcare day in, day out, but your sector, you've really understood and you've been able to tell others how this challenge impacts your your sector or impacts the way that you um, the way that you move about the world and and I think that's um, that's really one of the goals of, of leadership council in early years is to grow the ways that we talk to grow the ways that we connect uh, to our adjacent sectors around this this issue that can get complicated really quickly so I really want to thank um, thank our our friends and colleagues for joining us today to present um, Awesome slides, awesome information, great discussion, um, really appreciative, um, whether this is your first meeting um, as a surrogate or, um, or whether you have joined us all along, we really appreciate you being here. And looking forward to another meeting, I think, in um, August. And um, thinking specifically um, from that lens and working with a couple of our partner agencies on some content around children with special needs, which I know is another um, another particular interest of this council. So thanks everybody and have a wonderful Thursday um, and uh, see you soon. Take care.